if I um, I figured since, since I put this together, I can I can uh, do a little bit of a kickoff, and I'm, my hope is we'll each maybe take take a little turn, just sort of um, talking about the IDE. We use the development process that we follow, and you know, just there there should be plenty of time for folks to ask questions and and share tips as we go. Um, I put a clips at the top, so. Andrea, maybe I'll I'll talk about what I'm doing, and then hopefully uh, you, <laughs> afterwards you can you can tell me how I could be uh, using Eclipse a whole lot better, um, and then we'll uh, we'll just kind of move through. Then we'll do uh, NetBeans and IntelliJ afterwards. So just I did a wanted to I threw a little diagram together just as I was getting ready for the meeting, and I'll show you then my Eclipse um, configuration. So. Um, what I do, I do a lot of my Git interaction, the simple check in, check out with GitHub desktop, and then I do more complex things with the command line. And the latest version of GitHub desktop, one of the things I'm happy about is it now lets you, within a single directory, have multiple instances of the same repository. So I have a DSpace 5x local repository, a 6x local repository, and a 7x local repository. And the reason why I, I like having those separate is I have found it really difficult to construct my build path in Eclipse. So what I do is I, I, I and all of this I'm running on a Windows desktop, I run Maven uh, to build out all the runtime jars, and then I use just a Windows Explorer copy to put all the one copy of every unique jar into a 5x jar directory, a 6x jar directory, a 7x jar directory. That, in the process of copying into that location, um, it dedupes any duplicate um, uh, versions of the same jar file. Then I reference all of those in the class path. So that takes care of you know, the bulk of the dependencies, but um, I then need to add test frameworks, and, and I'll admit I, I'm adding these guessing based on the errors that I see in the Eclipse problem log. And then as particularly in 6x and even more so in 7x, um, all of the annotation layer stuff that has been added in to the code base, those are not found through this mechanism. So I sort of manually go through and try to uh, guess what the right annotation dependencies are. So I build up my class path. So this allows me then to change branch within a 5x, 6x, or 7x branch and for the most part successfully reuse the same class path without um, needing to rebuild it. Um, then for the, my actual, my, <laughs> my real job work, what I'm working on our Georgetown code base, we, we work off of the release version of the 5x um, code base. So I have a, a release 5x with our customizations and a private Git repository. That references my 5x project as well as reuses the same class path for dependencies. And then I have, um, I've maintained a 6x version, which I've not done much with in in a while, but that was an, an early version of trying to port our code base to 6x. Um, so I've got five local repositories. I tend to um, rely on the IDE to give me egregious compile issues in the IDE, but I generally then check any work I'm doing into GitHub and on a Linux server, I pull the code out, run Maven and Ant and deploy to the runtime. So I don't generally run the full compile step on my desktop. So that's that's kind of, that's my process um, as a whole. And just to show a couple other components, um, here's my GitHub desktop. And I've got the, this is my 7x branch, my 6x branch, and my 5x branch. And then if I open up um, Eclipse, I've got lots, lots and lots of stuff in Eclipse. Um, but here I've got my uh, DSpace pointing to master. Um, I need to go through, I'm, I'm down to, I guess I've got 23 errors, so I may not have done as good of a job as I thought eliminating um, 
dependencies for 5x. I'm down to just these four errors that I've never been able to get rid of, um, but I'm able to get uh, enough context messaging to actually, um, that the system builds enough that I can, I get um, context aware editing as I'm working in the code. And then 6x, I'm down to three errors here. So those are my three DSpace projects. And then I have my Georgetown DSpace and I have my Georgetown DSpace 6x branch. So those are, um, that's, that's my basic configuration. So I do, when I'm working in Eclipse, um, I, I mean, just, I, I assume many of you have worked in Eclipse, but I will uh, rely on the context aware or content assist that pops up <clears throat> as soon as you hit the dot. Um, I'll also rely on um, popping over uh, a class name or a method hitting F3 and navigating to um, definitions of uh, different bits of code. This is probably a poor, um, poor choice of a class to go into. Let me go into collection. Um, so here I can hit F3 and pop into DSpace object. Um, so, you know, I've used Eclipse now for 20 years, so um, it's, it's comfortable. That's why I keep using it, but I definitely ha have the sense from different technical meetings that I've gone to that other IDEs are, are better. I'm, I'm frustrated by how much work it is to actually resolve my build dependencies. This is something I, I wish um, was working better. That the last piece I'll mention that something I really like in um, Eclipse is the ability to click on uh, two different directories. So here I'm, I've got the DSpace API folder in my master branch, the DSpace API folder in the 5x branch, and then uh, running the compare tool. I think uh, Eclipse just has a really nice and really convenient um, compare tool. So particularly, I rely on this heavily when I've done minor version upgrades of DSpace. I'll I'm, I'm generally comparing uh, like 5.8 with 5.9. So I've got two instances of DSpace running. And then based on the differences I see, I'm manually choosing what to pull into my Georgetown uh, branch to apply particular diffs. Um, so so that's, that in a nutshell is kind of my Eclipse workflow. I don't know if folks have any questions. I'd be curious to hear if others are able to resolve the dependency things, because that seems like a kind of roundabout way of of doing things, just off the top of my head. Andrea, have you done this yeah. differently? I, I have just two questions to be sure to, to have understood uh, uh, the most important part. Do you run to the space web application inside Eclipse, or you Maven copy on an external topic? I, no, I, I, I always am running on our Linux server, so I, I purely uh, do enough development. I, I check in to Git. I probably check in too often, so I end up with messy commit histories. But essentially, anything I want to test, I check into GitHub and then uh, pull it out over on our server. Sometimes if I'm modifying like XSLT code, I'll manually deploy um, from the editor to the server and test those directly. But if, if I'm dealing with the Java code, I, I check it in and then pull it out on the server. Okay, so the other question for me is which version of uh, Eclipse do you use and which edition? I am using the basic Java edition and let me see what okay. version I'm running. Uh, Neon 1A. Okay, I see. So I don't know, Andrea, would you want to uh, maybe share your desktop and talk a little bit about how you use Eclipse? Yes, of course. All right. 
So I'm trying to do that. So, uh, and I see a few few additional people joined us. Hello, we'll, uh, we're kind of going through um, <coughs> my platform. So um, we'll give folks a chance to, um, if you've got something you want to share, jump in and, and share your experience. Yeah, I really appreciate your initial slide. I think it is uh, very useful to understand the world picture, and I see a lot of uh, similarity. Uh, first of all, about uh, uh, the, the difficult part to manage the class path in Eclipse, and uh, the difficulty to deal with different version of the space. So we shared the same approach than you about the space five, six, seven. Uh, we have different uh, um, folder where we clone uh, the different branch. And also we use different Eclipse workspace for each version. So essentially our optimization is focused on uh, reduce as much as possible the activity that uh, Eclipse do because Eclipse spend a lot of time building stuff and uh, update everything that is needed when you make uh, also a small change. So our major goal is to be able to fastly check locally all the change that we do. So our ultimate goal is to run the space inside Eclipse. So we want to have a full debug experience locally in, uh, uh, in Eclipse before to move to staging and uh, uh, production environment. So of course, when we have satisfied locally, we can go to deploy on the de uh, developer's stage server on Linux and, and things like that. Okay, so uh, the other thing is we try to update the clips as often as possible, and we use the web developer edition. Uh, there are uh, still something that we don't like. We are really not able to, to solve all the issue of Eclipse. So we do something that probably is not formally, formally appropriate, but uh, at the end there is a lot of uh, save of time for us. The first one is, for instance, uh, we disable validation of Eclipse all the time because validation on uh, DTD and uh, specification or AJB and things like that only slow down your Eclipse, but at the end we don't see any added value on use such feature. Or um, the balance between the added value and the time that the uh, resource that uh, this plugin consume are uh, too much. Uh, we don't use uh, um, the a Git plugin for synchronize uh, Eclipse with uh, Git, but we prefer to use uh, um, South Stream. So, oh, right, okay. So this is my South Stream that is a, a desktop client from uh, Atlassian. It is free. Uh, the only issue that we have with uh, South Stream is that. Uh, um, is limited to, to Windows. So our developer that, uh, um, that uh, use Ubuntu need to have a different, uh, a different solution. Quite often they just use the command line. So it is important for us then uh, in the settings of Eclipse, uh, we disable uh, the, the Git plugin. So uh, as the web edition come uh, automatically with, uh, uh, with the Git integration, we disable the, uh, we typically disable the automatic share of the project and uh, uh, the track of uh, each branch imported. This avoid Eclipse to continuously check for change of Git and uh, things like that that happen outside Eclipse on, uh, on Substrate. Uh, then that essentially we are able to import uh, the existing Maven project as Maven project. So we use the Maven to Eclipse plugin 
that is in, uh, bundled with uh, the web edition of Eclipse. And the uh, only issue that you have when import a uh, project using Maven is then uh, several plugins are not recognized. Uh, most of them are related to the native to ASCII uh, plugin of Maven and the other uh, stuff related to post-processing the resources. Uh, what we do is to disable these, uh, uh, these plugins in the Eclipse settings. Uh, this means that we don't run exactly the same code that will be built when uh, we deploy on the server. Uh, for instance, the WebXML is not automatically uh, processed by our Eclipse. So if you open the, uh, the Space Solar WebXML, uh, here we, you have uh, some uh, uh, placeholder that are not automatically resolved when Eclipse deploy to the internal Eclipse. Uh, our way to work around that is to change the configuration of the bundle uh, Tomcat in Eclipse. So if you look to if you look to the server project of uh, Eclipse, uh, in the context XML file, we had instruction to to replace the solar home. And uh, in the space five and the space six, we use the same approach also to define the context parameter for the space layer and the space config. This allow us to don't edit the web XML uh, at all, but uh, don't use the extensive resource consuming uh, uh, Maven plugin. So we just run the Maven package one time when we create the work page, uh, work, uh, workspace the first time to create uh, the install folder. And typically we uh, import the install folder as a gener general project in this space in Eclipse so that we can browse the mm -hmm. install folder uh, also inside Eclipse without open any other uh, tools so that we can immediately look to the space CFG and any configuration file in the uh, install folder. If we make a configuration change, we do that uh, uh, fastly in the install folder. And once we are satisfied, we replicate on the configuration folder to uh, synchronize with Git and things like that. Another thing that we uh, do typically is to run two server inside the clips. So we always run uh, two server, one dedicated to solar, and one dedicated to all the other web app that uh, we work on in this space. Uh, this again is to reduce um, a round trip, developer round trip, because anytime that you need to restart uh, Tomcat, it will spend uh, more time depending on uh, how many uh, web applications you have deployed uh, in it. So it is very unusual to make change to, to solar, it's not frequent. So we prefer to have solar uh, up and running, maybe in just in running mode without the bugging enabled uh, in a separate Stormcat that is uh, configured to run on, a, on different ports. So uh, by default, we use uh, 80, uh, 81 and just uh, plus one than to default for all the other connectors. And uh, that's almost all. So what I can show you that uh, I think that is very uh, nice is uh, I'm now uh, running all the servers. So I have Tomcat running with the uh, uh, Display 7 uh, REST API, and I have also uh, Solar running on, on the other server. So I can switch to the Solar console. And you will see here that unfortunately, it took a lot of time to, to start. So solar take uh, more than uh, 40 seconds and uh, uh, basic Tomcat server where we have the REST API, TOI, and maybe other uh, web application will take uh, longer. So in this case, uh, uh, near, close to two minutes. So one thing very, uh, 
good for us is a uh, um, commercial tool that we use in, uh, uh, in Eclipse that is named the Gerable, uh, that allow you to update your uh, uh, source code without uh, the need to, uh, to stop Tomcat, redeploy and restart Tomcat. So it is a tool that at that level of the virtual machine, changing the class loader, and is able to inject, uh, inject at runtime any change that you do directly in, uh, um, in the running environment. So if you look to my source tree, I have, for instance, I have prepared uh, uh, here um, a stash with just change to one single class that is the metadata field REST uh, repository. So, this is the current code that we have on to master that essentially allow us to have uh, API to find all the rest, um, all the metadata field. So if I go on my local host and uh, uh, refresh, here I have uh, 142 uh, field in my registry. So what I can do here is to change the code directly uh, I will just apply the, the stash. Okay, it is not so fast as I like. Yes, okay. And now I go in Eclipse. It will uh, uh, not change, so Essentially, I have added a new service that is uh, injected with Spring uh, to the metadata schema service. And I have added a new method that is uh, just a find by schema that allow us to implement a search rest method uh, to limit uh, the metadata field returned uh, just within, constraint the metadata field returned to a specific schema. So, here in the console, you see that uh, uh, this message. So JRebel, the JRebel agent just noted that I have modified uh, uh, my metadata field REST repository class and say that this class has been reloaded. So if I go to the R browser now and refresh, you will see a change here in the links section. It will uh, take some time because uh, uh, JRebel is able to understood most of the cache that need to be regenerated automatically. will uh, uh, update any uh, Spring bin that has been out of wired or loaded at uh, startup time. So the first it will take more time because it's uh, similar to a uh, Spring initialization. Uh, but now it uh, respond and uh, uh, you see here that the uh, search method has been uh, identified. So we have uh, uh, the search endpoint and the find by schema. I can just hit the find by schema. I will get an exception now because uh, it is uh, configured to accept a parameter. It is just name uh, VC and in this way I can get just uh, 83 uh, uh, metadata field that I have in the uh, Dublin core schema. So at the end, uh, JRebel save us a lot of time in uh, uh, debugging and uh, quick development because we never need to, for many times we don't need to restart Tomcat. Uh, Sometimes JRebel uh, uh, will just freeze. So if you make a, a long refactoring, if you make a lot of change, uh, you just need to stop your Tomcat and restart. But you are able to make a lot of change without deploying uh, anything. So for instance, here I can just add a system out. Uh, So I say hello and I save. 
Gerable notes the uh, that I have an update again to the class, and if I hit uh, the method again, I should get uh, uh, the system out. Mm -hmm. So you get hello. This is very convenient, especially if you are doing a long debug session, because you can update the code during the debug, and uh, you will uh, continue to debug from the next line without uh, the need to supply all the information or uh, uh, to follow all the stack trace. So it's just a reply on the flight of the, uh, of the code. If you don't have Jrebel, that is uh, also the situation for some of our uh, developer because Jrebel is uh, uh, in some way quite expensive. So for our senior developer, we make this investment. For other, we just wait a bit. Uh, in any case, you are able to run Tomcat inside Eclipse. That is really convenient because you can just point to uh, uh, add the debug um, point and uh, you will be able to understand exactly what happened uh, during code execution. So you are uh, here now, and uh, you can check and see that the schema name uh, is supplied with DC, and you get uh, the pageable information that has been uh, automatically bind by Spring with uh, uh, zero as starting, 20 as sites because it's default, and so on. And you can just go to the bug line by line. I, the other thing that I can show you is uh, our way to run a script uh, that is uh, uh, also related to the issue with the glass part of Eclipse. We also for uh, the script, we want to run the script inside Eclipse so to be able to debug. Uh, what we do is to create a run configuration uh, the, trick, uh, the tricky part is to uh, configure the class path. The most uh, fast way is, for instance, to always set as project uh, the web application that you run. So in the space five and six, we usually use JSPY. In the space seven, you just run the, uh, the, rest, um, the rest web app and you execute as main class the script launcher and you provide all the argument that you need for your specific script and as virtual machine argument you set uh, um, an environment that pointed to your uh, uh, this space install here. in this way you are able to just hit the run and the class path is nothing special is just the default of this of eclipse for uh, the project that you have selected using the Maven dependency that are uh, identified automatically by uh, Maven to Eclipse. So you can run the script or you can also debug the script. What we currently don't like and we don't have uh, uh, yet um, a solution that satisfies us is the, um, we have not identified a way to manage the, the code style because the plugin for Eclipse is uh, quite resource consuming. So if we enable the plugin, uh, our developer uh, uh, workflows slow down. Uh, currently our approach is just, uh, when we are satisfied with the code, we try to run on a continuous integration and uh, uh, it will report about any code style uh, violation. The other uh, issue is uh, related to unit test. Also in this case, we have not yet uh, uh, explored uh, to match the unit test integration of Eclipse. So we just run a unit test uh, on a continuous integration. Uh, that's all. If you have any specific question, I will be very happy to, to discuss. Yeah, this is really cool, cool to see what's possible here. Yes, agreed. That's a, 
a very, very impressive uh, setup you have in Eclipse, Andrea. Um, <clears throat> I, I had one um, specific question. I think maybe I just uh, missed this er early in your presentation. Um, but um, how are you deploying the web apps for the uh, embedded Tomcat server? Um, that is, um, at, at what point do you um, do the Maven build and, and then the ant install? Is that done from inside Eclipse or is that at the command line or something else? We, yeah, we just need to run one time to Maven package uh, for the installation process. So we use Maven package and ant uh, install, fresh install to, to set up the, the space install deal on the local environment. And after that, we never run Maven from Eclipse. We just rely on the uh, Maven to Eclipse plugin that is bundled with uh, uh, the web developer uh, edition of Eclipse that uh, automatically configures you uh, to overlay and uh, all the stuff that is required to, to build uh, a real web application. So if you look to the, uh, I'm now on the space seven. So to the space spring rest uh, project, uh, if you look inside uh, here, you have mom and dependencies, and this is resolved by- Thank you, stop staring your screen, Andrea. Oh, so we can see it. Yeah. Sorry for that. Uh, okay. So I have this space spring rest. So the process is we import an existing Maven project. So when you start with an empty uh, Eclipse um, workspace, you need to run import and say existing Maven project. And you will point to uh, the, mm, the root folder where you have check out uh, uh, the space, uh, the, the space source. So if you do that, Eclipse will recognize all the, uh, the project inside this, uh, this environment. So you have all the different module, uh, the space OI services, uh, the different web apps and so on. And each of them will be imported as a different project in, uh, uh, in the space. Of course, you also have the, the space parent project that include exactly the same file. But this is imported just as a plain project, so you cannot do anything interesting here. What you can do is uh, uh, on the web app project, uh, Eclipse will automatically recognize them as a, a web applications. So in the project facet, if all go well, you will be automatically enabled the dynamic web module. And this is what allow you to just click uh, the right uh, button of the mouse and run on uh, uh, run on cell, where you can configure Tomcat and so on. If you inspect the structure of, uh, uh, of this Eclipse project, you will see that the target folder that I make uh, uh, visible in my settings, just to, to be sure that Eclipse do the, the right thing, include a lot of uh, subfolder, and these are automatically generated by M2F, that is Moment to Eclipse uh, plugin. But this is something that you get automatically out of box when you download the web tool uh, platform. So it's just the web tool edition of, uh, of Eclipse. And, and that's all. So you can just run on server and uh, it work as it was just a simple web application all uh, done inside the clips. The tricky part again is to set some configuration in the context XML of the, of the server, because you don't want to, uh, to change all the web XML file or other thing. Uh, Otherwise, you will be asked to, to commit every time this change, and it is just inconvenient. I have answer to your question, Jasmine, James? 
Yes, that's uh, that's excellent. And um, as a matter of fact, it um, um, leaves me uh, perhaps with even more questions. Um, so, uh, when when you uh, go um, into your servers and you configure your Tomcat with the context XML, um, does that uh, enable um, your embedded Tomcat server to uh, actually serve uh, the web apps that Maven itself is generating rather, rather than what uh, Ant has installed for you? Yeah. This is the only thing that you need to do. I see. So, okay. Very so interesting. This, this is what you need for solar. And for the space five and six, you need uh, another element that is named, uh, uh, I think it is parameter, where you set to the space dot dir and the space uh, uh, minus config, that are the two uh, attributes that uh, the space five and six have into WebXML. It is important to set override to false. This is in some way counterintuitive, uh, but if you look to the uh, documentation of Solar, this means that uh, as this is the configuration inside the servlet container, this override said that uh, the web application is not allowed to override this setting. Otherwise, what you have in the web XML uh, win over this configuration. Yeah, it, it should be like allow override. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Wow, that, that is very, uh, very um, cleanly set up, uh, a little bit of complexity to it, but it's a very nice arrangement. Yeah, I need to say that we are very happy when it works. <laughs> but if you look to, if you search on Google, you will find a lot of uh, uh, thread about uh, the Eclipse dance. That is sometimes something go wrong and you don't really understood why it stopped to work. So typically what you need to do in this case is to, first time you try to clean all and have Eclipse to rebuild off the source. The second time you will go to uh, right click and uh, use the Maven um, menu to say update project. You select all and force an update over everything. 99% of time, this solve your issue. Uh, sometime, uh, I don't know exactly one time, every two, three months, you just need to, to wash your Eclipse for space, do that another time and it will work. But uh, yeah, if you do a lot of developer, this is the fastest way that we found. Uh, and another important trick is uh, when you change something, maybe on source three, uh, Eclipse not always uh, recognize the change. So you need to uh, hit the refresh. Uh, you can select all, you just need to skip the server that is not a project that you can refresh and you can hit uh, F5 to refresh the, uh, the workspace. In this way, Eclipse will be sure to synchronize with the file system. Uh, I use uh, the package explorer view that allow you to make this refresh. In the default view that you get with Eclipse is just the project explorer. And I don't know why, but refresh is not enabled. So you just need to switch to the package explorer. Well, I've got to say, Andrea, that a lot of that sounds uh, very familiar to people in my shop as um, Java developers. We're, uh, Eclipse is a very finicky beast, and uh, yeah, doing the uh, Maven update dependencies often helps. And um, if you really pose your workspace, then it never hurts to just uh, reimport the stuff too. Um, but uh, one other kind of high-level observation I make based on your presentation and Terry's is that um, while Eclipse is a very powerful tool for DSpace development, it also um, 
it seems that it works best when you turn off a lot of things. Yeah. So uh, well, turning, turning off the validators, for example, that's something I, that would never have occurred to me. Um, but yeah, that kind of disabling uh, features that are getting in the way, it seems like a very... Yeah, this is, this is very important. So uh, you need to disable everything that you don't need because you get a lot of plugin and uh, each of them spend time. So also to a Git plugin uh, loss uh, a lot of resources uh, is just inefficient. This is my personal opinion. So. Great. Is there anyone else um, on the call here who uses Eclipse who who's got uh, some other experience you'd like to share? All right, well, how about, uh, let's uh, talk about um, IntelliJ next, and then Mark, maybe we'll do uh, NetBeans at the end. So um, I think, uh, Tom, would you be up for sharing a little bit about how you use uh, IntelliJ? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'll try to share my screen. Uh... All right, I'm able to see it. Okay, and then mm -hmm. probably need to fetch things to... You still see it? I can. Okay. Um, so I'll try to um, go over the same topics more or less. Um, for Git, um, for checking out branches, um, I think most of our developers use um, the console, um, but you can also um, do it with IntelliJ, um, or you can say uh, which branch you want to uh, check out or which remote branches there are there. Um, the Git functionality in IntelliJ also works very well. Um, you can do, um, you can use a menu, a Git pull somewhere, um, but most of the time I don't use the menu and that's one of the most powerful features of IntelliJ I think is that IntelliJ is very good in um, indexing everything. So what you can do is um, you can search um, for an action and then I type pull and I tell to git okay pull the latest changes from the server. Um, or uh, it also works well for files for example the thing that I almost use every day is uh, suppose that is the feedback screen um, and I want to know where this message is and what the key of that message is. So I copy it and then you can do an IntelliJ uh, search in path and then I tell, okay, find me this string and it's almost instant that it finds it. It's really, really, really fast. And that was, I switched from Eclipse to IntelliJ four years ago um, and the, the search capabilities of IntelliJ are um, incredible. Um, also, for example, if we try something else, so for example, I want to know where this class, CSS class is defined. I just go and then tell IntelliJ, hey, search everywhere, and then it instantly finds all the places where that, where that string happens. Um, you can also say, hey, I only want to search for CSS files. Um, and you get those. So that's, yeah, a use case we have a lot because the client asks, um, hey, I want to change this message on that screen or I want to have that button um, in a different color. Um, so being able to very fast find uh, the place where it is defined is a, a huge advantage. Um, it also works well for files and, um, and classes. So yeah, uh, you can search for the group DAO, then it finds that one, or you can do with capital letters. So you only have to do that. And then I can say, I want to go to line 30 of that file. And then you go to line 30. So if you have a null pointer in file X, online 
50. Um, then you can just directly jump to that file. Um, it also works for regular files. Then you have to use the, um, yeah. Um, an important part of um, in using IntelliJ efficiently is um, learning the, the keyboard shortcuts so that you, you can almost use IntelliJ without a mouse. Oh yeah, I think you can if you know all the keyboard shortcuts. Um, there are a few common ones that we, that we use a lot. It's like, hey, you go to a class or you go to a file uh, where we say the solar statistics. Uh, this is also very useful um, to see like, okay, I have a, um, a property here and I want to know where it's used. And then again, you use the the search capabilities. And as you can see, it's yeah, it's really instant. That um, once IntelliJ index is like, if you re if you set up your project initially, it takes a while. It takes a, a minute or two um, for IntelliJ to index all the files. But once the indexing is done, it's yeah, uh, it's a huge huge advantage. Um, and that brings me to the project setup, which is also very easy. Um, so for, for new project, what we do is we do uh, file new and then project from, uh, so we do a checkout of a, of a repository. Um, and then we just say, okay, project from existing sources. And then um, you go to that directory and you select the root POM file. And then you say open, um, and then IntelliJ will, yeah, um, detects that it, that it is a Maven project, and it will automatically fix um, all class path issues and all, um, yeah. I've never had any class path issues so far. Um, then for running Tomcat is a, bit trickier, so IntelliJ doesn't, um, doesn't have an embedded Tomcat server. So what you have to do is, uh, uh, what you would typically do is like, hey, I have a new, I want a Tomcat server, which is a local one. And then initially this list is empty, so you have to push configure and then hit the plus button. And then you have to tell IntelliJ, hey, where did you, download Tomcat. So you have to manually download it um, and then go to that path. So for this one, and my Tomcat home is on my uh, development folder under the Tomcat directory. Um, that's one step you need to do. And the second step is that, similarly to what Andrea showed, um, is a trick with um, having the properties in the WebXML filled in. So what we do there is, uh, no, you don't see that. I'm switching screens, but that doesn't work. And now you, yeah, now you see my console. Eh? So what we would do here is, um, so in my Tomcat that I defined in Intelli I, that which IntelliJ is aware of, under the configuration Catalina local host directory, I have a D space XML context file um, which points to um, the DSpace installed here on my machine. Um, There's a config file and where the DSpace there is. And similarly, you have the override files um, things. And then, does everyone see IntelliJ again? Because I'm not sure how the screen at the desktop switching yes. in Mac works. Yes. With the, <laughs> okay. And then with deployment, um, yeah, so this is the DSpace context 
um, which I'm using and for solar is the same. And then IntelliJ knows um, how to start Tomcat and which, which context to deploy at runtime. And then you can run it in debug. Um, so similar to Andrea, you don't, you don't run the ant task. No, we, we do. Um, because um, as you saw in the, maybe I can open it here, that would be easier. So let's go to, Because I'm, we, I'm pointing to a DSpace install there. So my, the typical workflow is I run clean package. Okay. Um, which is just a regular, um, yeah, in this directory, run clean package with these profiles because we use profiles to um, um, override certain properties. Um, and then I have a, a bash and update script. Um, which just, yeah, is a, a short for end update and clean backups, I think. Yeah, it's just end update. So it updates the, the display installer. Um, but the thing what you t tell Tomcat here here, this is the actual um, war that is made. So I can say, and these are the war that the wars that IntelliJ detected. So, what this XML UI artifact corresponds to uh, this XML UI folder, and in that folder, the the web XML Yeah, in this case it did. Yeah. In here it did fill in, but there are cases where they, they don't fill it in correctly. And then that's why you need a property in the context file. So we run and update because configuration files are still retrieved from the actual install there. Um, but the, web ops itself are loaded um, from the target directory within the module. That sounds confusing. Yeah, that sounds a bit confusing. <laughs> no, it's uh, helpful to see there. Um, so for debugging purposes, um, by default, what, in, what you have available is the, um, yeah, so let's first try I'll first show the debugger, um, which is here. See, I'm still alive. So as you can see, my machine does take a while to load this space, but the IntelliJ indexing is really fast. So even on, <laughs> slower machines, which is the machine I'm, curr I'm currently on. The IntelliJ search index um, still works uh, very well. So this is actually, yeah, this is, yeah, the, the Tomcat is not embedded in IntelliJ, but IntelliJ does fully manage it. Um, and then, I have to wait. So what I wanted to do was create community, test community two, and I need to create. So now I'm in my debugger where you can see the, um, 
the variables and we can yeah you can step over it and you can step into a method which is the same i which is present in all ids i think um but the cool thing is also that you can like okay we see that now i'm an admin um because i had an e-person object um but that's now you can do things like drop this frame so you can do a step back in time so we drop and we're back at one level higher um we can even take it we can also drop this one so i can and here i can say okay now suppose you can start to manipulate um manipulate the the memory to check why the book occurs or how it happens so one thing is that like okay suppose we don't have an e person so now my e person is zero and then i can um, play again and then you will see it yeah okay i'm not authorized because i yeah i erased myself using the debugger um, other cool things that are helpful are um, yeah that doesn't work anymore So I also have to say that this version is the ultimate edition, um, which is um, not free. Um, I do think that as a DSpace committer, you can get an ultimate license. Um, but there is also a community edition, which most of the things that you see here um, are also in the free version. But I can't say exactly which features. Uh, One thing I may remember from, I, I installed the community edition first, and I think the context aware editing wasn't available in the free edition. And so that was then, I, I reached out and uh, Tim mentioned the available licenses for uh, Yeah, I think like the basic code completion is still available. Um, I think if you want to have spring, spring might be already um, only for the uh, advanced spring functionality um, might not be in the in the free edition. So another cool thing you can do is you can evaluate uh, so that's easy for I to inspect why things are broken or you can um, more, I'm not sure if I have an example here. No, you can, um, you can also write hibernate queries. Uh, like you can try db dot uh, session factory. Good. Uh, So I can do something like, yeah, so this is now a not so useful query, but it's just to demonstrate that the evaluate expression, I being able to stop at a certain point in the code and then do a few checks for like, okay, what does the database see or what do I have in my session? Um, That's okay, there is one e-person in my database. Um, I can also see, for example, for the people uh, fighting with Hibernate, <laughs> um, the contains method, so I can check is my, the e-person e object, which is currently in my scope, is it part of my Hibernate session? Uh, yeah, so this is something I'll also use a lot to um, debug hard bugs <laughs> to check what what's going on. Um, let's do my break points off. Uh, so besides Tomcat, you can also debug um, DSpace scripts, which is similar to what Andrea showed, which is we um, call the script launcher. Um, we need to tell 
we need to tell it where the dspace install directory is of this dspace instance. Um, then the command to run. Um, and then for the class path, we just use the, the global dspace. Hey, the, this is not a parent, but the one below. Uh, and then, the, yeah, IntelliJ figures out which libraries to add to your class path. Um, I see we're running out of time, so I'm going to go a bit quicker. One other cool feature, and I'm pretty sure this is only for the Ultimate Edition, is the Database Explorer. Um, so you can also use IntelliJ to um, attach to your data, inspect your database directly, and you can um, Uh, you also have code completion here, so I can uh, from e person. So IntelliJ yeah, also indexes your database schema, and you can uh, where email is, and then so that's also very powerful. I easy to if you don't remember the exact column names, and you don't you I, you don't have to leave IntelliJ to do it. Nice. Um, then about unit testing, um, so we are able to run full unit test classes or um, individual methods. What we have to do for that is, um, so that's a new JUnit configuration uh, with the class and the method I want to test. And then here is, um, you need to point it Again, you have to provide a dspace dir directory, but the tricky part here is that you have to um, point it to the target to the testing dspace directory. So the dspace, when you run it in with tests enabled, it will generate a, a, a testing install directory. Um, so you have to pass it that, and then yeah, just use the same cloud path, and then you can also debug. Um, Debug unit tests, so, so we'll use it here for the listener. So suppose I want to have a debug point here, and we run this in debug. So also, um, we this is just an IntelliJ with its default configuration. Um, we do not disable, uh, we don't have to disable any special plugins. Um, you can install, install additional plugins like for check style, um, or in my case also for um, bash support. Uh, IntelliJ. So while it's running. And so you can also add support for uh, other languages. Um, to edit. Uh, oh, can I can I ask you a question? <laughs> no, so uh, that's not allowed. <laughs> of course, you can ask a question. Uh, if you change something, maybe just add a system out. Your workflow need to to run the clean package, or ah, yeah, that was uh, what I also wanted to show. Yeah, so. Um, uh, let me try. So if I uh, so as long as you don't change any um, signatures, you don't have to um, uh, clean package. But you can do the yeah. What was it again? I think just recompile. Um, but I always use a shortcut um, shift command F9 in my case. So what, so here below in the screen, you see it's rebuilding and then you know, checking sources. And now you see it's class reloaded. Um, so now if I, well, I'm still, Uh, point 
Come on. So these are uh, it outputs test. Um, this is the default. So this comes out of the box um, with the default GVM. There is also a special kind of GBM, but I don't know, re remember the name by heart, um, which allows you to also reload um, classes if, they, if the signature changes. So what I can't do with my current setup here, um, because we have a few developers who use the other GVM type, um, I'll come back to this later, um, it's like, a, for example, if I add a, a parameter here, like string key or something, this won't reload because now the signature is different and the GVM I'm using doesn't allow to do that. Um, but as long as I don't add methods or parameters, it's very easy with IntelliJ to read, dynamically reload classes into the Tomcat. Um, I'll have to look up the other GVM if, which has even more advanced things. But yeah. okay. This also works for um, JavaScript files and or Cocoon XSL files. Okay, if you change the signature, you just need to build and restart Tomcat or you need to run Maven clean package? Um, by default, we always run Maven clean package again, um, just to be sure, so especially if we change a lot of things. Um, we, yeah, we, we tend to use just Maven clean package and update and restart Tomcat. In theory, you could do the re yeah. You could do the rebuild, the rebuild if you. I'll need to test that, but by yeah. How much time uh, it take to run encrypt package on your uh, laptop? Uh, yeah, it depends. Uh, uh, maybe it's better in the one. So what um, we tend to disable all the things we don't need. So mm -hmm. minus RDF, minus DSpace sort, minus rest, minus sort two. Okay. Um, so it only builds the API services and in this case rest. So that already speeds up a lot of things. Um, yeah, but then it still takes a while. So yeah, but for Small changes you can, um, yeah, you can reload them on the fly. Uh, this is the debugger of my unit test, um, which is it, yeah, which stopped in the solar usage event listener for my bitstream download. Uh, that's to illustrate that. Uh, was there something else I wanted to show? Uh, No, I think that are the, the most important things. Well, thanks. That was really, really cool to see. And so I know we, we've got about uh, 20 minutes left and wanted to shift. I know uh, Mark, Mark Wood agreed to show us a little bit about how he uses uh, NetBeans. So uh, Mark, should be up for uh, sharing? Uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever shared a screen in this product before, so we'll bear with me. And I think, Tom, you'll have to stop sharing. Uh, I should stop sharing, sorry. <laughs> and then I have to find my... Stop. I know Zoom, the Zoom, yeah, okay. <laughs> Zoom uh, window always hides itself. So, um, Mark, you should see if you hover down low inside of Zoom, uh, a big green arrow for share screen. Yeah, let's see. Is that working? It is. Okay. Uh, well, I've been getting lots of notes about things I ought to try. Uh, okay. Let's, I mostly have some mail scripts that I've written that set up things for me so that I, you know, don't have to do a lot of the, you know, work in NetBeans, not because I'm you know, not because I tried it and didn't like it, but just, you know, I'm accustomed to doing a lot of stuff on the command line. Oh, okay. So let me see if I can actually do this. Here, uh, okay. 
I just have the, you know, the one directory tree here for stock D space, and I have another one for our you know, local code. Let's see. Here's how I you know, start a you know, start working on a you know, a Jira issue, for example. Let's see. Yeah, this one's already up to date. Mark, is it possible to make your, your text a little bit bigger? Oh. Uh, At least on my end, it's kind of hard to read. I don't know if other, but other folks can see it, but it's a little bit grainy on my end. Oh, sorry. Let's see. Um, there's probably a way. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if it's only me, it's okay. I just was asking. Are others able to see the screen okay? Uh, it's not very big, but it's not green for me. It's it's white. Oh no, not green. I, I said grainy. I'm sorry, not grainy. Green. Kind oh, of like blurry, blurry, <laughs> it's blurry on my end. But maybe it's just my screen then. Oh, here we go. Let's see. Uh, is that any better? Yeah, it's That's only better. Yeah, it's slightly better for me too. Looks good. Even better. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, that's one of my scripts. It writes a you know local config. Most of that's boilerplate. It just you know fills in a few things based on the you know the name of the based on the name of the instance I'm making. Uh, let's see. So like I have a you know a place I put all my D spaces. Let's see if I can make that a little more readable. Try that again. Okay. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, another script that deals makes a hard link to that as local.config so that I can have several of these. As you can see, I have a few. Uh, let's see. And at that point, we should be set up for NetBeans. Uh, let's see, has it noticed me yet? Oh, great. Now I'm lost. Colonel, yeah. Uh, Statistics. Okay. I don't know if it's noticed yet that I am in a different branch. It hasn't. Hmm. I am in a different branch, right? Oh, no, I haven't switched to that yet. That, sorry, I'm uh, 
not very organized at demos. Okay. Now it should notice in a moment. Okay. NetBeans keeps an eye on what branch I'm working in. Let's see. It is possible to use, you know, let's see. Oh no, where is it gone? Yeah. Okay, I have a you know a plug-in for Git, which is why it's noticing what branch I'm in. Oh, uh, there are all the usual tools for doing that stuff in NetBeans, but I haven't used them enough to be confident yet, so I still do most of the Git work on the command line. Uh, At any rate, now it knows that I am working in you now this branch that I made for the Jira issue. Let's see. I don't really have a lot to show about NetBeans itself. Um, one thing I did want to bring up is that NetBeans will run Tomcat itself, but that's another thing I don't do in NetBeans. I just have Tomcat running on this workstation. In fact, sometimes I've had as many as three different versions running concurrently. That got a little swappy. Uh, you know, this is one of the notes that I got while I was watching everybody else's much better presentations. Uh, it is possible to attach to that, you know, Tomcat, but I, I haven't set up to demo that. I'm sorry. <laughs> probably have to set a different port. It would take so long for me to figure that out that everybody would go to sleep. I do apologize. I will try and you now put some notes together on these things. But I do use the you know the built-in debugger in NetBeans with the external Tomcat occasionally. Oh, let's see. Oh, come on now. Also, you can run the, you know, the unit tests within NetBeans, but our unit tests are not really built for that. So sometimes I, you know, if there is not a unit test already for a class, I will write one as a debug driver and I'll try to write it in a way that works well in NetBeans or, well, it would work well in you know, most IDEs, I think. Uh, basically, that involves doing a lot more mocking and stubbing than we have tended to do in our unit tests so that the test run never goes out to the database, actually, uh, never goes looking for real files, actually. The test itself provides everything that the you know, class is going to need. And again, I wish I could show you that, but I didn't think of it until I was watching somebody else's presentation. Uh, okay, I, you know, since I'm using an external Tomcat, I do use the, you know, Maven clean install, uh, and fresh install and update quite heavily. Um, let's see. Come back here. And Mark, are you are you pretty happy with your tool sets or are you are you contemplating making any switches? I am happy with the way it works, but I've made some notes on things to, to try. I'm going to try running you know, you know running Tomcat from NetBeans. I just haven't given it the time that it needs to get get it working properly. Let's see. 
Here's another one of my strange little scripts. That makes several contexts that I can drop into Tomcat. So I can just you know, copy that. control list on the Tomcat configuration directories so that I can just copy contexts in. Uh, let's see. It's probably not running because I didn't build a database for it yet. But you know, doing it this way, I don't have to restart Tomcat very much because I can just you know, we'll touch that file that I just copied in there. When Tomcat notices a few seconds later that the file has changed its, you know, write date, it'll reload the application. And that takes, you know, less than a minute. Let's see. Let me see if I can actually get enough put together that we can see whether it runs or not. This is one thing I haven't automated yet, and I really want to write a script to do it somehow. Let's see. Okay, now we have a database. So maybe that thing would actually do. But we're about out of time and I haven't built it yet. So there's not there's nothing to you know, to see. Well, thanks for uh, for showing us this is another uh, another um, option interesting all the common challenges and and approaches we've got across the different IDEs. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of minutes left. Is there anyone who has a question about you know, NetBeans that I could answer, perhaps? One thing that I'll, I'll note um, is that uh, I used to use NetBeans um, uh, up until relatively recently, and the, the instructions for using NetBeans are actually still mostly up to date, which I'll link them into the dev channel and the DSpace side. So we do have some ID instructions. There's also some for, on the wiki, there's also some for IntelliJ and Eclipse, but those are, the IntelliJ ones are pretty up to date, but the Eclipse ones are really, really, really old. Um, but this might be an area that we could start to gather more notes and just even like potentially restart these pages, recreate them <laughs> to some extent, because a lot of the information there is kind of outdated. Um, but I just want to forward that along as like another resource here. Uh, and NetBeans, those NetBeans instructions include how to run DSpace with Tomcat and NetBeans because I used to do that um, up until recently. I think my only frustration I ever ran into with NetBeans is I found it really slow in terms of re-indexing things, but that might have just been how I had things set up on my end. So eventually I got frustrated and felt like it was just too slow to, to, to boot up and moved away from it. Yeah, starting NetBeans does take a minute or two. Uh, I have a lot of plugins loaded. Um, however, I switched to NetBeans from Eclipse because I somehow it was getting into a state where regularly it would take an hour or two to start Eclipse it's because it was rebuilding everything over and over and over. It's probably better by now, but I switched to NetBeans and never looked back. But I might try IntelliJ one of these days. Yeah, 
Yeah, it could all be a matter of what you enable and disable. Like Andrea mentioned, Eclipse seems to work well if you disable a couple key things. And it might be the same way on the on NetBeans side. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's all kind of a matter of personal preference. Uh, well, let's see. Um, one of the things I like in NetBeans particularly, well, okay, here's another one. I use the, you know, the built-in Javadoc formatter a lot, which is why I frequently complain about code that doesn't have doc comments in it. Like that, for example. I hate seeing Javadoc not found. Okay, the thing I was actually going for, though, was, let's see, what do we got here? Yeah, uh, I like the you know, things like go to the implementation of this interface. It, probably all the IDEs have got that. And I'm already there. Yeah, go to source. Yeah, usual stuff. Any questions about NetBeans? All right, well, thanks. Thanks, Mark. And I'll, I'll mention our, our meeting next, one of these meetings is May 15th. We're gonna talk about um, running DSpace inside of Docker. Pascal Becker's got a really nice um, presentation to help people um, understand what Docker does and how to build up um, containers and then Tom Desair is going to talk about using Docker containers to test DSpace uh, and Oracle. Uh, so we'll, we'll do that on May 15th. Um, next Tuesday at about this same time, I'm doing a webinar for DuraSpace on how to make very, very simple code changes to a DSpace 6 instance. So if you know any folks who are just wanting to get their dip their toes in the water with DSpace development. Um, I think that presentation will be a good um, introduction for folks. And um, thanks to everyone for uh, participating and uh, presenting. This was really helpful for me. Yeah, thanks all. It's been wonderful to see all the see different all the environments. environments. Thank you, everybody. I got lots of good notes. Thanks. And we'll post the video as well on the wiki. Okay.